on deep diving to LLM architecture by Enric Ferro. I'm excited to introduce uh, Enric Ferro, a uh, dynamic and innovative uh, technology leader, currently making waves as a co founder and CTO at Silum AI. Enric's journey is marked by his dedication to blending technology with social impact. Evident in his work at Silum AI, a platform revolutionizing the training deployment and scaling of large number models in production. So please join in me warmly welcoming Enric Ferro, a visionary in AI and technology, as he shares his insights and experiences with us today. So I call upon Enric Ferro to please take over the session. Thank you.
uh, how many people actually are understand how an LLM fundamentally works? We want to just talk in general. Anyone has any idea? Like what are the fund four fundamentals for LLM? No one? So let's start. So uh, early on, uh, most of our MLA started with this uh, something called RMS. These are a very basic uh, neural network system where basically you had a, a single node that would recursively keep uh, computing the uh, model. The biggest issue with this kind of model uh, was that we had this uh, concept called exploding vanishing gradients. So for those of you who are studying basics, you would have heard of this concept of gradient descent. So in gradient descent, we basically try to optimize the uh, yeah, so we try to optimize and reduce the loss uh, uh, rather than training. So what is happening in RNNs is that uh, if you uh, run this on very long sequences of text, uh, either the gradient would blow up exponentially and the uh, computing will fail or it would just go to zero and you won't get any output after that. Uh, so some time went on after that and then after we got a uh, new concept called LSTMs or long short term memory. This was the first, one of the first times that the concept of memory was introduced in neural networks. So the concept was basically when I'm uh, running on a sequence of text, I want to remember some information and keep that in for the long term, so uh, throughout my generation. And then I also wanted a short term memory. So that was to uh, keep track of things that I just uh, uh, sent into the model or just happened something like that. So they had different variations. And then based on them, I would run certain, like uh, my output is to be generated accordingly. Now, some of the biggest challenges with uh, this system was uh, again, you have to run the blocks one after another, similar to how you had RNN, so it didn't solve for that part. Uh, so, that made this system incredibly slow to compute and run. So, it was not only really scalable, uh, and beyond that, it still didn't have a really good understanding of things. Uh, so, after that, another 20 years or so go by, and then I met me at this guy. Uh, so he's really smart, he can transform to a truck, has weapons in his arms. I mean, just kidding, he got something as boring as this. <laughs> so Google researchers published this paper called Attention is All You Need Apparently. Uh, so in this paper, we got this very famous diagram which looks like some bunch of things interconnected, no one really knows what is happening. There are some inputs, some output tiers. Uh, so, um, as a whole, this transform basically broken down into two major tiers. So, you have the encoder and decoder. In LLMs, we primarily focus more on the decoder tiers. Uh, if you if you talk usually about something like embedded models, that uh, today we had another talk about how to build an array GPS server. So, there is a use this uh, encoder model is more popular. Uh, now, time for some math. Uh, which obviously no one loves. So most of transfer architecture or even MAA in general is very math heavy. Uh, for those of you who didn't know, you can now see it live. Uh, so now a lot of you might be wondering, like do you need to be like some kind of math genius to be able to work on MAA AI transformers and LLMs? And the answer for that is like yeah, somewhat, like you need to have somewhat kind of understanding how the systems work, but even without diving into the math, there is still quite a lot you can understand at a much higher level. Uh, so the first step uh, that uh, we do in this transformer layer is something called tokenization. Now, uh, what we are trying to achieve here is basically computers are not capable of understanding text as it is. So what we need to do is we basically take this text and we need to convert it down to a number representation so the computer basically gets like a better understanding. Uh, so as you can see, this is basically uh, GBD's tokenizer. And if you notice that carefully, a token is not exactly a word per se, like it varies depending on how it is uh, learned the word representation. And this is something that we also uh, commonly call as vocabulary in uh, the LLM world. So basically, this how it gets broken down. And then each of these numbers, you get converted to some number. Uh, so that is step one. So first step is we take a set of words, convert it to numbers because that is what computers can understand. 
Beyond that, uh, we go next to something called token embeddings. So now this one number is really not enough to give like a good representation of a version zero. So because of that, we introduce this concept of embeddings. So when we usually talk about this word with one, this is something what is happening behind the scenes. We basically take a number and we convert it to a vector based embedding. Over here we're talking about size 502. That means we have this vector, this you'll have know, uh, 512 numbers that basically represent the word your or cat something like each other have a different representation. And if you see over here, uh, this number representation is fixed for a particular word. So over here at cat and the last word is again cat. My embedding is the same, like it's not different based uh, on where the word is placed. Uh, now one uh, uh, problem that people notice with this approach, uh, it doesn't know, like this is just part of it, is that in English, or not just English, but in most languages, uh, the position of the words matter a lot. Depending on how many words are arranged, they can have a totally different meaning. So, now to fix this, we came up with a set, uh, second solution called uh, position embeddings. So, to do position embeddings, we use some kind of sign based ways. So, we put the building the mathematical equation or a chunky before. That comes down to some graph that looks like this. Now, why this was chosen uh, by the research team is that you can see a very uh, like, you know, clear pattern over here, like, okay, this data kind of goes like this. So, that is the reason why this kind of an equation was chosen. Now, of course, we have a bit newer uh, position encoding method, but then we'll talk about that later. Uh, so, yeah, now what we basically do is uh, this one is still your word representation. So, again, you can see cat, cat over there is here. Now, after what we do is we create a position embedding. So, what this does is this tells my transformer where in a sentence a particular word is placed. So, this uh, set of numbers it basically tells the model like, hey, this is the second word, I keep this in mind. So, you can see, like, your uh, now if you can see the uh, catch representation of the uh, position embedding, and over there, they are both very different set of numbers because they are in different positions in the sentence. Now what we do is we basically take this and we add it up to get a new set of numbers. So now this final vector representation, it has a combined information about what my word means and also what my word means with respect to the position in the sentence because that is very important to us. Uh, now most of the board are like what is this? I came here to learn about what attention is. So now we jump into attention. So in attention, we deal with some equation that looks like this, where your query schemes, you run a softmax. So, basically, on the whole intuitive level, uh, what uh, these QKV values represent is uh, basically I have my query value, which is the word that I'm looking to, and now I need to predict the next set of tokens. Uh, so, what we try to do is we basically want to see, like in the past, which all words matter, like from the token that are generated, which words are important to us. And then based on that, we try to do the uh, next token generation. So as you can see, this is what we call an attention matrix. So these are just a set of random numbers that I put over here. And this are your uh, query values. Those are your keys. Uh, for those of you who understand maths a bit better, this is a query vector. And then we have K transpose to basically uh, shift the orientation of the vector. Uh, below here, we have uh, this value. Uh, so usually, in, if you notice, in lot of uh, math that is related to transformers or MLA models, we we'll always try to divide or multiply by a certain constant. And that is usually to uh, enable some kind of a stabilization uh, factor because training these kind of models are very unstable. So either your values go very huge, they go very low, they go negative. So to avoid those kind of ambiguities, we try to do these kind of values so the numbers like either they say centralized or there may be something around zero or some factor like that. So, this basically brings the value over and then softmax basically gives us a set of values between 0 and 1. So again, capping it makes sure it's more stabilized for all these things. Uh, so once my attention matrix is completed, uh, which is again set of numbers, basically what this tries to show us is uh, which set of numbers uh, I should attend to work. So higher numbers usually get higher attention. Okay. So all, all it means is like in the past this word was spoken 
and this word might be important to you for generating an Excel document. So that is the number that I should pay attention to more. Then we finally multiply the uh, B uh, vector or the B matrix basically. So uh, again, what the uh, what is written on B is now that I know uh, what I should attend to. For this particular word that I'm attending, attending to, what should be the final token? So basically, the correlation between Q and T is uh, tell me which tokens should I attend to. And then between that and B is now that I know I'm attending to this token. Now what should be my next token? So that is what you get and that is our finding of uh, the entirety of attention works. So as you can see, like uh, now obviously you will see this pattern very commonly. That is because obviously you have a word here, word here like if you multiply it, like that gets a very high attention score uh, just by basic intuition. Uh, now the biggest uh, thing that we want to do at training a transformer uh, model is uh, basically when we are training it, we don't want it to look ahead of the words that are there. Because when I am feeding the sentence, I just want it to be like, okay, these are the words before it. Look at only these words and try to predict the next token. If it can already see the words ahead, it's kind of like cheating. It already has the answer, it's not already going to learn the lot more. So to do that, uh, we use uh, some kind of system that we call attention mask. Uh, here it's called a triangular mask. So basically, the concept over here is, we basically mask out this top set of values because they are the words ahead. Uh, so the transform cannot actually look that what is happening here. So as you can see, like this image is not that great, but then you can see this set of numbers are like striped off. So usually like you set a number like minus one or uh, infinity kind of thing, like a very, uh, like those kind of values. So it gets basically gets set to not infinity, minus one or zero. So it basically gets locked off. Uh, now this is uh, more on how your multi-headed attention works. So all this time we are talking about this concept called self-attention. Where it is like which token should I focus on, which token should I credit to. Uh, now uh, basically to uh, make that uh, attention system a bit better, we have this concept of multi-headed attention. Where what we try to do is, we basically instead of using one attention head, so this one attention combination, we need to split it into four. And the logic here is that basically my uh, multiple attention heads, they should try to learn something different. So maybe there's a word. Maybe one attention head it learned that okay, this word is an adjective, maybe another word understood that okay, this is a word. So those kind of uh, uh, things. So that is where multi heads come from there. So again we have a main matrix matrices and then you're basically your sequence gets split into four heads because you know we are we are using four attention heads. Uh, all the same computations on here at UKAP, you will multiply them or uh, run your softmax computations, all of these things. Uh, this is how it is. So it's basically the same thing again. You have your uh, self attention and you just have multiple heads that are attending to it. This is the most scaled up your where it actually fits in. So this is basically an entire transformer block. Over here we have multi head attention where we have this multiple heads running and here we have a few KV uh, matrix calculations. Uh, now another third part that exists in transformers is called cross attention. So this is basically where uh, we take the, uh, uh, what we basically do is we take the uh, uh, key and value uh, pair, uh, sorry, the keys and the values from the previous uh, decoders or encoders depending on how your model is structured and we just get a query from the current decoder. Now why this is done is, uh, again like these are like auto regressive based models. So when I'm passing a query, I'm passing to a decoder but it needs to have uh, information about what was generated before. So that is the kind of information that could have keys and values. So that gets fed in, into the material data attention or the decoder. So, as you can see here, we had your population here again push the value. Now again, a very important uh, piece of this puzzle is something that we call field forward networks. Now the reason why field forward networks exist is to add some kind of non-linearity in the system. So for those of you who have heard about um, activation functions, uh, Ray2 is one of the most popular ones of them that everyone talks about. 
But in transformers, uh, the one which is proposed to be the subtle gain, and as you can see, it has like a slight dip. So that is the induces some amount of non-linearity. This is not just not a uh, non-linear linear function. The reason why we want to use non-linearity is because it helps the model understand uh, more complex and nuanced uh, things in our scientific. And yeah, that is a lot of information in a few minutes. Uh, now, this is how these transformers work in models like GPT. So you would basically have like tons of this decoder stack. They would pass in information. And again, the auto regressive models for token by token would be generating outputs. Uh, now, finally, we come to a bit more interesting stuff about LLMs after transformers. So, these are basically, I would say, not categories per se of LLMs, but then the way models are trained basically. So, we have base models, then we have uh, supervised factory models, we have reward models, and finally, we have RLHF, which is now kind of a phase out for methods like DPO. But then, we have a So, yeah. Tons of LLM models, all are different ways of even. So let's start with the first one, which is a base model. So for creating a base model, or as we also call foundational model, your first requirement is you need tons of data. So as you can see, like these are some of the more popular public data sets that exist out there. You now obviously companies are trying to get their hands on private data, add that to the training process when general synthetic data are created for more data sets, these kind of things. So, once you have your data, basically what the retraining does for foundation models is maybe take a start of foundation model to get an uh, output and look something like that. So, what is uh, given is the model has no understanding about what is happening, it doesn't need more basic English, can't write a single word properly. So, what we do is we create this entire corpus of documents. Uh, and basically, the model tries to create an understanding of. of this word, sentences, various uh, grammatical things. Now, since we are thinking, like, for example, about uh, Shakespeare data, so you can see scraps of it, absolute random text, which after some iteration, the stories are getting better. Then, after 30,000 iterations, you can see like it's a pretty good model, has a pretty good understanding of what is happening. So, this is a pre training process. And now, base models or foundation models, they can't really be used for chatbot because you can think of them as very advanced, uh, uh, basically completion models. So if you give it a sentence, or if you give it a question, all it's going to do is, it's going to continue writing more questions, it's not going to uh, give you an answer. Because that is what it's good at. Basically, it sees a pattern, it tries to like, complete a pattern. So as you can see here, like some, somebody has write a poem about bread and cheese, and then it just kept writing that same thing. Now we see these models can always be tricked into doing random things with prompt engineering. So someone said, hey, here is a poem about bread and cheese, and what the model thought is, okay, this is the heading, and now the first time the poem is supposed to start on this. And you can see here, just started writing something that is somewhat resembles the poem. Now, again, there are some ways to prompt it, as you call it, you should prompt it. So what you would do is give it some question answer examples, and then the model thinks like, understand that, okay, this is how it's supposed to answer, so a new question comes in, then I'm supposed to basically answer it, so I'm trying to uh, create more questions. So, that is step one, pre-training foundation models. So, all your GPTs, llamas, distills, all this kind of models come over here. They are trained on like a uh, vast amounts of data, a uh, few months of computational times, about millions per hour of GPT computer <coughs> computer cost, and then you can do like this. Uh, after that we enter something called fine tuning. So this is where we try to start creating our fine tuned chat based assistive models, these kind of systems, where we can actually interact with the model and get an answer back. So for uh, fine tuning a model, your prerequisite is that we need to question answer this. Because we are basically trying to teach the model that it is a question, it is an answer. So we also need to feed data in that particular model. So, fine tuning is typically a lot more uh, like, uh, like lower intensity when it comes to computing. So, here, like, uh, we 
the number of people who are studying is over. There are also other fine-tuned models that have been trained in like a few days and they out like they usually uh, come up with something like even GPDs. Uh, then like most people discuss are saying that they are creating models, like I'm not having a big foundry, so actually spin out these foundation models, but then a lot of companies say they are creating a own model, usually they are just fine-tuning models. And like most of us even try fine-tuning in Flourishman because like we have had so many advancements in fine-tuning that you can just really spin up a collab notebook and you can create a basic fine-tuning model. So yes, uh, like if you have like a smaller data set, you could do it like in an hour or two and get a pretty decent output of that. Uh, after this we come to something called reward model. So this was something that only uh, till now usually your big AI companies are doing so something like OpenAI and Anthropic. So the concept here is basically I want to do some kind of a reinforcement learning system. So now the way we do that in LLMs is that I have to basically create a reward model. Now what you do to create a reward model is basically we generate the same answer three times and we ask human evaluators to uh, basically rank which answers are worse. So they would rank like hey, this is the first best answer, this is the second, this is the third. So based on this data, we basically try to fit a reward model based on this information. And once you have the reward model ready, we finally use that reward model to uh, basically do kind of reinforcement learning on the base foundation model. So that is how we get a final GPT 3 GPT 4 all your uh, newer uh, uh, AI model. So this is the first step. So basically you have to start a foundation model. Unless you have the budget of a few millions of dollars, I wouldn't recommend anyone to try that. Uh, beyond that, find is something most of you have been trying to respect. You can get a decent model with just a few hours of fine If you want a really good model, maybe a couple of days with a very high quality data set, you can have a really, really great model. Uh, reward modeling and reinforcement learning was and still is kind of a research topic. So I wouldn't really recommend a lot of people to enter it. Unless you're talking, unless you want to try something like direct preference optimization or DPO. So DPO was actually tried by this model uh, by Honeyfish when they were creating this model called Zephyr. So for those of you who don't know what Zephyr is, so Zephyr 70 uh, beta was a model that is fine-tuned on Mistral 7B and it uh, basically outperforms or is on par with a Lama 2 7 b So that is how capable fine-tuning is. So they just took a 7 b model and they are uh, hitting capabilities of a 7 b model of it. So the biggest benefit with DPO was that I don't need to do a reward model spend, you just directly or uh, like you have a different mathematical equation and it's basically run the reinforcement learning logic on your uh, base model itself. Now, a very common thing that people seem to think in LLMs is that I just stack more decoders, I just take a bigger model and then like, I'll have the best model out there. Which works up to some extent. It's not entirely wrong, but it's also not entirely true. Like as I said, the more example of the So again, this, there are some concerns that we call scaling logic. So this was a paper that had come out like with a chinchilla model where the concept was that uh, to uh, utilize a large model very well you basically need to train it on a lot more data to actually make use of it. If you don't have that much data then you might as well just take a smaller model and you most probably outperform with the bigger models that are not trained on significant amount of data. Because if you just take a big model the most of the wasting compute or not that good of an ROI at the end of the day. Um, yeah, so beyond that, this is something about rotary embedding. So this was what was used by Lama. So as I had shown the sinusoidal uh, position embedding before that had a pattern. The biggest issue that people uh, figured out in sinusoidal embedding is that they have basically absolute position values. So let's say I'm training a model for a 2K context link. And let's say someone put a token after it, the model has zero idea about where the position is because it's not trained to understand it. 
Well, as I know what we decided is that it's not an absolute set of values. Let's create a relative system. So now the model can actually like basically have like a pattern kind of thing. So as you can see in this, uh, this is a rotation system. So you basically get the relative values. After the 2000 tokens, after put some set of tokens, the model still some model to understand like okay, this uh, the position of this token is after this uh, because it. Um, like if we move from the absolute scale to like more of a relative scale. Uh, again, a huge with our context lens, everyone gets super happy when they hear about models that are like crashing even context lens. So we have 100k, 200k, very soon we'll be going for, I don't know, half a million, a million context lens. But the biggest issue still remains is that uh, when increasing context lens, the models are still not proving to be that capable of remembering a lot of data. So uh, this is still like the older models that you will see. Like this was way before the 120k model was out. But even in this case, you can see like the accuracy starts off pretty well. But as I keep dumping in more data, more documents, the model accuracy slowly starts taking a hit. And that is also true when if you like consider some like the models like uh, GPs 120k. So beyond uh, I think people have tested for like up to 30k, 40k, and then after it starts taking a pretty big hit on accuracy, so it starts to forget like a lot of things in a lot of parts the context. So, to give you a consistency that even though you have large context and models, try to keep the context low, don't push it too much data, put it on what is relevant, and you will mostly get a much higher quality generation. <coughs> and other things are not passing a lot of data, uh, uh, you will get an answer out much more quickly. Now, uh, this is a very interesting thing that I wanted to show you guys about how more of an understanding we have about your models. So this is from a paper called uh, uh, Gated Linear Units that was used in Transformers. This particular one is, uh, I think it's called a Swiglu function that was used in Lama, in the Lama set of models. And as you can see in the paper, confusion set, uh, the authors of the paper have given an explanation of why this works very beautifully. <laughs> and then like, we have no clue why this works. So that is how good of an understanding we have about these models. It's like people say like, you know, we are doing this match, but then really on a very fundamental level, like, we still are trying to figure out like, hey, why did this model generate this token? Why did it do this? Why did it answer certain way? A lot of questions are still left to be answered are uh, totally active reverse topics. Uh, another very interesting thing with LLMs is like this was very initially discovered, I think about a month or two back, or that was called first of the most. So, all this basically speaks is that if my model is trained about some data in a certain way, it might not have to correlate information the other way. So, there are schools uh, documented, it says the director of what a movie, if I ask, uh, who directed the same movie? And it comes up with some random answer. So we think that okay, just get an LLM and run it to answer it one way, but just reverse it, it's very easy for it to do it. But then again, LLMs are not actually a reasoning machine, they're just trying to predict the next token. They don't really have a very good sense of reasoning and understanding. And now, another thing that we seem to be moving towards is trying to go for like more smaller set of models that are uh, easier to run, maybe that you can run locally on the system. So this was, these are the benchmarks for visual 70. So this is 7 billion parameter model. And you can see here with uh, the benchmarks versus Lama 270, Lama 230B, then the Lama 124 means. A 7 billion parameter model outperforms most of it in, uh, 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 yeah, in most of it as well. So if you are in knowledge of Lama 124 b it's outperforming. And even your pretty similar. So we are slowly seeing like smaller models become more powerful, then we train them higher quality data sets, more vast amounts of data, getting up like being able to compete with uh, some of the much larger models over there. And yeah, this is another model. This is the model that I was talking to you about in the file. So you can see the benchmark number, the 7 with uh, one on 80 benches so was 7.34. And then we have uh, yeah, the Lama 2 child model is 70 
can start reading, start with some basic research papers, or there are some people who make videos on the explanation of research papers. You don't have to take time deeper than one, but I'll somewhat explain the videos. And in any case, like if you want know, to you know, connect, catch up on the video, or ask any more questions about NLMs, genetic AI, you can always connect with each other. So, yeah. With that, we have come to the end of that session. So I would like to call upon uh, Mayor, the co-founder of the club, to present the uh, present the uh, book to our uh, as a token of gratitude from our side. So uh, I call upon uh, Mayor from the club to present the book. Back of my mind. 
So, if and like who is like, can anyone raise your hand and tell me who is your favorite author? Author. Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek. Okay. So, what we can do is one one of the teams can uh, download all Simon Sinek's uh, like uh, whatever written content that he has. Like he has written multiple books. He has written blog posts. He has given talks, so we can transcribe the talk to to text. So all of that data we can collect and fine tune the model, and then ask the model to to uh, explain some new concept, just as Simon Sinek collects. So in in that way we 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 kind of extracting what kind of the kind of way that author speaks and generalize it, and then ask the LLM to generate. Uh, output in that that sort of way. So that is something that we can try out. We can we, like uh, specifically maybe we can try out some Malayalam models also. We can try out uh, like emails to it. If you if any of and if you are a writer like you write blogs and all, you can use your data. We can train uh, like SQL generation, Python generation. So there are multiple tasks that we can do. Some of these. I have already tried to collect some data sets so that you can straight away start uh, working on it. Some of these will require some sort of data preparation. So uh, we'll try and uh, like divide into ten teams and one team each whatever you, you want to build. We can, we can either go for ideas from here or any any new ideas that you have and uh, try to find through some of that which ones to write. Does that sound good? Awesome, awesome. So we'll we'll probably start at six thirty. So uh, right now it's a short break. So uh, it's a longer break actually. Uh, so uh, like see you all back at six thirty uh, here, and then we'll start off with the fine tuning sessions. Thank you.